third Tuesday of every month from 6 to 7.30 to explore various topics regarding healthy choices and lifestyles. These could be tools to help you find your healthier self or tools on how to stay healthy once you reach those goals. Topics will range from how to handle stress in a healthy way to the power of walking to the importance of sleep, which is our topic for this evening. We also have selected a few interesting and insightful documentaries for your viewing and consideration. The goals for this series are to inspire positive change and to help you become a healthier you. These meetings are open to Skylakes employees as well as members of the community that we serve. You are also eligible to win some awesome prizes after attending each seminar. The prizes include gift certificates to Fred Meyer, um, Sherm's Thunderbird, Asante Yoga and Soul, The Ledge, Hutch's Bicycle Shop, and even the Farmer's Market, which is held downtown during the summer. I am so excited and grateful to see all of you here tonight. I know everyone gets busy in their day-to-day -day life, but it's important to take time out for you and to focus on your health and your well-being. I truly believe in this program and I'm confident that you will take away very valuable information that will assist you in making the positive changes in your life that you are ready to make. So tonight's speaker I am very pleased to introduce is Linda Tessman. She's a physician's assistant working with Dr. Knossian um, with sleep medicine, um, pulmonary medicine, and intensive care medicine. Um, she graduated from OHSU and has been working in Clinic Falls for the last 15 years. She is an avid cyclocross racer, biker, runner, swimmer, apparently all things active. So she very much appreciates and understands the importance of a good night's sleep. So let's all turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much for coming out, everybody. This is a much bigger audience than I would have ever anticipated. So, um, you guys picked up some papers tonight. One of these things is an upwards sleep scale. So while I'm speaking, if you wouldn't mind taking some time and just filling this out. And we'll hit this topic a little bit later on in my presentation. So I was asked to talk about sleep. And boy, you know, you wouldn't think there's that much to talk about, but I could probably talk forever. <laughs> so. Um, Stephanie asked me to talk about healthy tips for sleep, so um, let's begin. So sleep is the golden chain that ties our health and our bodies together. Sleep is interwoven with every facet of daily life. It affects our health, well-being, our moods, our behaviors, our energy, and emotions, our marriages and jobs, and our very sanity and happiness. I think you all can relate to that. <coughs> so, um, I'm actually a registered polysomnography technician. Um, I could technically work in the sleep lab. Technicians typically work at night. Um, but I spent a lot of time scoring sleep studies working for Dr. Panosian. And I looked a lot at a lot of these. They're called hypnograms. And basically, when we score sleep study um, in the lab, um, we look at somebody's sleep architecture, and this is an example of what normal sleep architecture looks like. Um, when the line is up at the very top, it means this person is awake, and then the line falls down to the very, very bottom, where you can see where it says A and B, and that's actually delta sleep. And delta sleep is, if we could put it in a bottle and sell it, we'd be rich. Um, it is the most refreshing restorative sleep that we can get. Kids get a ton of delta sleep. Um, as we age, we lose our delta sleep. And delta sleep is extremely important because it is the only time within a 24-hour period of the day where your body releases growth hormone that's responsible for repairing your body's daily wear and tear. And if you're not getting delta sleep, you're not getting that restorative sleep that you really need. And if you have any kind of sleep disorders or sleep disruption, that's the first stage of sleep that gets knocked out. And so a lot of people who have sleep disturbances end up not having any delta sleep. The big black bars are where there's dream sleep or REM sleep. It's rapid eye movement sleep. And in the lab, we're actually watching the eyes going up and down. And so we can't tell what people are dreaming. Um, I probably don't want to know that. Um, but um, we can definitely see the eyes going up and down. 
And so there's a certain amount of dream sleep that's normal during the night. It takes about 45 minutes to get into that first period of dream sleep. And the, long, the longer during the night, the longer span of REM sleep that you'll get. Um, so the last period of REM sleep, a lot of times people will remember their dreams the last dream of the night, and that's because it's the longest period. So, um, what happens during our sleep? Well, it's really important that we get interrupted, uninterrupted sleep um, because you're, you're, you have to basically rejuvenate your mind and your body for the next day. If your sleep is cut short, you don't have time to complete all those phases of muscle repair, memory consolidation, um, release of certain home hormones, particularly the growth hormones um, and appetite. A good night's sleep helps us to prepare to concentrate, to make decisions and engage um, in our, our day for the next day, whether it's school or work. So the next section of my talk is really going to focus on sleep hygiene, and that's probably why you're all here tonight, because you all want to know what the magic bullet is to make you all sleep better. Um, one thing is, is it's kind of like, you know, sometimes people don't set priorities where they need to be, and sleep tends to be one of those. Um, we tend to find other things to do before we go to bed. There's some cleaning that needs to be done, some homework that needs to be completed, um, chores, what have you, and it seems like we tend to put sleep off. Um, but it's really important that if you find that you're sleepy during the day, the number one cause of daytime sleepiness is not getting enough sleep. So you need to make sleep a priority and make sure that you get to bed at a decent time. Um, establishing a really good schedule for your sleep is very important. Um, it tends to be um, where we often find on the weekdays that we will go to bed earlier and get up earlier. And then on the weekends, you turn around and you find yourself going to bed <coughs> later and sleeping in later. And that's actually a really bad habit. If you're having problems sleeping, you really want to try and limit that variation so that you're not, your, your bedtime compared on the weekdays versus the weekends and your wake time isn't varying by more than an hour. If it is, then, um, you may have a hard time, like teenagers particularly are, are bad about on the weekends, they'll stay up really late, Friday night, Saturday night, come Sunday, they're not exactly tired to go to bed at the time that they should be going to bed. So then they can't fall asleep, they go to bed, they can't fall asleep, and then they wake up for school the next morning and they're really tired because they didn't get enough sleep. And so, um, you know, as adults we probably do it too, but not to the same degree that teenagers do it. Um, your body has a circadian rhythm. You have two dips in your circadian rhythm a day. One is right before you're going to bed. Um, it tends to be when you start feeling sleepy, that's a sign that your circadian rhythm is taking a dip. Um, you also tend to have a dip in your circadian rhythm in the middle of the afternoon. So a lot of times when people say, after lunch, oh, I just ate too much for lunch, I'm sleepy, it's not really what you ate, it's just that your circadian rhythm took a drop. And so people who tend to be a little more sleepy, they may be more prone to taking a nap in the afternoon because of that. So creating a good bedtime ritual. So this is another one of those things of prioritizing your sleep. Before you guys go to bed at night, um, trying to prepare yourself for bed. Make a relaxing routine. Um, hot bath, listening to some soothing music, um, stretching, some yoga, something relaxation, re relaxing to you so that you're not so geared up before you go to bed. Um, try not to do a lot of work before you go to bed, have heated conversations, um, or exercise to late in the evening. They recommend using your bedroom only for sleep and sex. Do not use your bed to do work or crafts. So um, really, your, your bedrooms should be a sanctuary for sleep, and that's pretty much it. Um, you want to uh, make a, a behavioral association between um, your bedroom and some peaceful, relaxing, restorative sleep. Uh, bright, uh, 
Bright lights can affect your circadian rhythm, and we recommend avoiding um, bright lights in the evening. So before you go to bed, keep the lights kind of dim. Um, when you get up in the morning, expose yourself to some bright light, especially, you know, sunlight. When you first get up, look out the window, you know, get some sunshine. Don't stay closed in all day and keep your, your blinds down. Um, your, your circadian rhythm, your sleep rhythm, really is um, it's affected by light cues. And so if you are exposed to a lot of bright light right before you go to bed, um, it's, it's the wrong cue to get ready for bed. So especially people who work in the hospital under those fluorescent lights, um, you understand that if you're working second shift and you need to go home and go to bed, it takes a little while to wind down and that's just trying to, um, you know, because you've been so beat down with these uh, bright lights all night. So um, winding down before you go to bed, we talked about this. You know, reducing stress and anxiety before you go to bed. Um, uh, if, if you feel like sometimes you wake up during the night and you have a lot of worries that you're trying to problem solve the world, um, in the middle of the night it's really a poor time to be doing it. Um, if you know that um, during the daytime that you have some problem solving that needs to be done, you, you should probably take care of it then. Um, you know, if you want to keep, if you're really bad about it, keep it a piece of paper by the side of the bed, write down your worry, go back to sleep, think about it the next day. Try not to problem solve your, your world's issues in the middle of the night. Reading's probably one of the best things that you can do before you go to bed. Um, and not necessarily on a backlit iPad or a computer screen. Um, I think some of the um, some of them that don't have the backlight on them are probably okay to use, uh, but preferably a book. Um, meditation and stretching are great things to do before you go to bed as well. So, <clears throat> we tend to eat our biggest meal of the day around dinner time, and some of us eat dinner quite late. Um, they recommend that you shouldn't eat two to three hours before going to bed find that dinner time is kind of running late, you probably ought to think about eating a later dinner. Um, if you eat spicy foods, fatty foods, sp fatty foods in particular take a long time to digest. So um, it will <clears throat> disrupt your sleep some. Caffeine, um, if you're sensitive to having a hard time falling asleep, having problems with insomnia, caffeine has, it's a drug. It actually has a half-life of five hours. Five hours. It takes four half-lives for caffeine to get out of your system. Well, that's 20 hours. So if you're drinking caffeinated products in the middle of the afternoon, you know, they're going to still be in your system come the middle of the night. So if you're really sensitive to caffeine, um, limiting, try to limit it just to the morning hours. Alcohol. A lot of times people will, um, they will self-medicate by drinking <coughs> alcohol because they know that it's a sedative and that it might help them fall asleep. But alcohol has a metabolite and in the middle of the night, after, if you're drinking a fair amount of alcohol before you go to bed, the alcohol breaks down and the metabolite from alcohol actually can cause some sleep disruption. It will make your sleep more fragmented, um, it will keep you in a lighter stage of sleep and um, prematurely potentially wake you up too early in the morning to um, not allow you to get a full night's sleep. So even though it's a great sedative, it is a really super sleep disruptor. And smoking is bad too. You know, people who smoke, you know, cigarettes are great for every occasion out there. But smoking, you know, people smoke when they're happy, when they're sad, when they're hungry, when they're talking on the phone, when they're driving, what have you. But it really is a stimulant. And so um, sometimes people smoke to calm down their nerves, but it still is a stimulant. And so smoking before bed can rev people up, or smoking in the middle of the night is also particularly bad. So um, any kind of electronic device that has a backlight on it is typically going to emit blue light. Um, it's a phase of light that actually can be kind of stimulating for certain individuals. And if you know that 
if you're playing some computer games or working on your computer before going to bed and you notice that you have a hard time falling asleep, probably you should not be playing on your computers before you go to bed. And I have a lot of people who say, boy, I wake up in the middle of the night and I get my little game thing out and I play solitaire for a couple of hours and that helps me fall back asleep. Well, that's probably not the best choice. Um, picking up a book and reading and doing something more relaxing is a better choice. Napping. So, you know, we're, we all can nap from time to time, and napping is good for some reasons. You know, um, sometimes we get sleep deficits, and I always say sleep deficits are kind of like taking too much money out of the bank. Um, you can put money back in the bank by taking a nap, but it can also be counterproductive. So, um, you know, you can make up for some losses of sleep. So, if like every day during the weekday you get cut an hour short, <coughs> come the weekend, you might be able to sleep a little bit longer and make up for some of those deficits, but it's not the same as getting a regular night's sleep every night. If you're going to nap, try and keep it somewhat short. If you're sleeping for two to three hours in the middle of the day, that's probably not a really good habit. Um, unless you don't mind. I mean, I have some people who are retired and they don't mind sleeping on and off all day and all night, but that's not exactly healthy. Um, exercise. Vigorous exercise is recommended because it makes you sleep better. It makes you fall asleep quicker. It gives you more delta sleep, that important refresh and restore to sleep. Um, and some people are not real fond about vigorous exercise, which is fine too. Exercise of any sort is going to be helpful. So get out and move, but just don't do it too close to bed. So I have a lot of people who tell me how they wake up during the night on multiple occasions to go to the bathroom and to let the dogs out and that their cat is sleeping on their head. Um, your animals really shouldn't sleep in bed with you. Um, they sure are cute though. Um, you want to try to keep your bedroom somewhere between 60 and 67 degrees. That's the most comfortable temperature for people. Um, we also live in the desert. Adding some humidification to your bedroom will make your sleeping more comfortable. Um, I have a lot of patients who tell me they sleep with the TV on. That's a bad habit. <laughs> um, put it on a timer. If you like to fall asleep with your TV on, put it on a timer so that you're not having it run all night long. Um, and the same thing with the radio. If you feel like you need some noise in the background because you live in an area that's really noisy and you need some white noise, um, consider some white noise devices. And then, of course, if your bed partner stores and is making a lot of noise, then some earplugs might be helpful, too. So we talked about the humidifier. Uh, your bedroom should be dark. If you're having a lot of light filtering through your windows, that is potentially going to be able to go through your eyelids and give you a light cue, particularly, um, you know, if you're going to bed when it becomes dark and you're getting up when the sun rises, that's one thing, but uh, most of us don't live by that lifestyle. So keeping your room nice and dark is particularly good during the summer months. Mattresses. They last about 9 to 10 years, and that's a good quality mattress. So sometimes people put a lot of money in their mattress and they say, well, I think I'm not getting very good sleep because of my mattress, but I don't feel like you have to go out and buy a sleep number bed or a Tempur-Pedic bed and spend thousands and thousands of dollars. Put a good quality mattress and just make sure that you replace it regularly. If you have allergies, um, allergy-free pillowcases are made. They can put covers on beds and that can also help. And try to make your bedroom an inviting place to be, a place where you want to go. Um, if you have clutter everywhere and it's, you know, dirty and messy and your sheets are half off the bed, that's not really inviting for you to do that. <laughs> so, how much sleep do we really need? Well, it really varies because, um, Baby infants need a lot more sleep than adults. Teenagers don't get nearly the amount of sleep they should get. Um, and if you're not getting the, the, you need a certain amount of sleep for your rapid, the rapid mental and physical development. 
Um, and they're going through a lot of changes during their childhood. Most parents don't need, don't understand how much um, sleep growing kids need, um, and that how much of an impact that a loss of 30 to 60 minutes every night can add up for kids. It makes a big difference. <coughs> One thing about really young kids is that um, it's kind of hard to know when kids are not getting a su sufficient amount of sleep um, because young kids don't act drowsy when they get sleepy. They tend to get a little bit more wound up. And so you probably, if you've been exposed to any young kids who's overtired, um, you may recognize that it's really kind of hard to get them to calm down when they're overtired. Sleepiness in... Um, Kids can look like attention deficit disorder. Um, it can make them hyperactive, um, they resist bedtime, they act hyper, and this is all from just not getting enough sleep. Attention deficit disorder in kids is also often seen with young kids that have sleep apnea. A lot of times people would think that sleep apnea is a problem of adulthood. But in young kids, one of the symptoms is learning problems and hyperactivity. This is kind of a graph for how many hours of sleep that we need. So newborns need 12 to 18 hours of sleep. Um, toddlers, 12 to 14. In preschool, 11 to 13. School-age children, 10 to 11. Teens, 8.5 to 9.5, which... <laughs> How many teens are getting that much sleep? And then for adults, this graph says seven to nine hours, but really, from what I've read, as an average, it's usually somewhere between six and 10 hours. My general rule of thumb, I, you always hear that, okay, you need to get your eight hours of sleep. Well, eight hours is really an average between six and 10. Um, if, you're, if you think you're getting by okay on less than six hours, there's probably a problem. If you're sleeping for more than 10, problem, or 10 hours, there's also likely a problem. So this cartoon is good for kids. It's a time machine. You get in it tonight, when you wake up, it's tomorrow. <laughs> so what causes sleepiness? Obviously, not enough sleep, and a lot of people think that um, it's not that important, but that's the first thing I have to, to talk to people about when they tell me that they're sleepy. You need to get enough sleep. Look at the environmental factors in your bedroom. Is it too loud? Is it too hot? Um, is there animals in your bed? <laughs> um, are there things that are waking you up during the night that you can prevent? Depression and other mental health problems can cause a significant amount of daytime sleepiness. And you may be getting enough sleep, and when you're depressed, you just want to sleep more. And so, you know, if there's no other health problems going on, sometimes that's a good avenue to explore. Certain medications can be um, very stimulating and affect your night's sleep. So, we work in a pulmonary practice, a lot of people are in inhalers, they're stimulating, there's a lot of heart meds that are out there that can be stimulating. Um, some heart meds are actually, can cause a lot of drowsiness when taken in the morning. So look at your prescriptions. If they say, take them in the morning, take them in the morning, if they're supposed to be taken at night, make sure you're taking them at night. Particularly cholesterol medications and certain um, hyper hypertensive agents called beta blockers. Those are best to be taken at night because they can cause a lot of sleepiness. Um, pain. Pain can interrupt the sleep a lot. Um, pain can interrupt your delta sleep so that you're not getting that deep sleep. So a lot of times people are, they don't want to take pain medications, but sometimes it's a good thing so that you can get the sleep that you need. Um, we talked about al alcohol and caffeine and cigarettes. Um, sleep apnea. Um, that's the bread and butter of what I do for a living. Um, I see a lot of it. Uh, it can cause sleepiness during the daytime, but not everybody who has sleep apnea will experience daytime sleepiness. Seizures. Most, common, most commonly people who have seizures actually have seizures at night more so than during the day. So 
Sometimes people only have seizures at night and they don't have them during the day. So that's something else that we look at um, when I evaluate people for sleep disturbances. Narcolepsy can cause daytime sleepiness. It's a fairly uncommon problem. Um, a lot of people think they have it when they don't. They usually have sleep apnea. But it can cause, um, it's a problem of REM sleep, a problem of dream sleep, where you need dream sleep not only during the nighttime, but you also need it during the daytime. And so it can cause a sudden onset of sleepiness and people end up feeling like they need to sleep during the daytime. So a few words about insomnia, and I didn't really want to get into this too much because we're trying to keep this healthy. But, um, you know, I just want to remind everybody that not every night is a good night's sleep. So if it's just once in a while, that's normal. Of course, practice good hygiene, all the things that we had talked about. <coughs> um, if you feel like there's certain things that can potentially affect your sleep and you know you may have a hard time sleeping and you can predict it, there's some, there's some things that you can try to help you sleep. Melatonin, it's over the counter, it's a natural substance, it's not FDA approved, there's really no means of determining if there's active ingredient in the pills. Um, the evidence-based medicine around melatonin, it um, doesn't exactly support it. But what I, my personal experience is with this is that I have some patients who tell me that it works for them. And if they don't take it, they don't sleep. So. It's always worth trying, and if you try it and it works for you, great. It doesn't interact with other medications. It's super safe to take. Um, so if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, don't keep continue to take it. Any of your over-the-counter PM medications basically contain Benadryl or something called diphenhydramine, which is a first-generation um, antihistamine, and those come with a side effect of drowsiness, which is nice if you're using them on occasion. But if you're taking something with Benadryl in it every night, that side effect of drowsiness usually wears off after three consecutive nights of use. So if you're using it once in a while, it's, it's a great thing to take. Um, but if you're wanting to take it on a consistent basis, it's probably not the best idea. You also want to be careful about the dose <laughs> because sometimes people feel drowsy in the morning, so maybe taking half a dose is actually better than taking a full dose for some people. There's a lot of prescription medications that are available for sleep. Benzodiazepines, um, uh, they're muscle relaxants, they're um, anti-anxiety medications, they're sleeping pills. Um, they relax your muscles, they, they tend to help people sleep. Some of them work for short periods of time, some of them work for long periods of time. I don't prescribe them. Um, they are, they, they build tolerance, so if you take something on a regular basis, a benzodiazepine at night, your body becomes dependent on it. And then after a while, you require a higher dose to get the same effect. And so then your dosage keeps building up and you keep needing more and more, and then your body gets dependent on it, just like any kind of other um, drug dependency, and you can't stop it. And so it's not a really good choice to use for insomnia. Non-benzodiazepine agents are things you probably see on TV, Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata. Um, Ambien has a, a generic called Zolpidine. Um, they come at the expense of a fair amount of side effects. Um, they can cause some amnesia. They can cause some really odd behaviors at night. Um, I had a lady one time take an Ambien, and she was ordering stuff off of the TV, the um, <laughs> channel where you can buy stuff, and uh, yeah, QVC, and it was showing up, she was getting all this stuff on her doorstep, and she never remembered uh, all this stuff, so, you know, it can be very variable, people may just walk around the house at night, they may break the refrigerator and not remember it, um, so, if you're doing weird behaviors on this medication, you probably shouldn't be using it. These medications aren't meant to be used long term either. Um, it's okay if you use them once in a while. I, I do prescribe these on occasion, but I, I <coughs> tell people if you're going to use something like this, using something every other night at the most is, is about the most I want people to use them. Because these two, your body can kind of get dependent on. Package insert doesn't say it, but I know people who are on these for months at a time. You try and 
take them off of it and they experience insomnia for like the next three or four nights and they just can't sleep. So it's kind of hard getting off of them. There's a bunch of antipsychotic medications, and I don't really prescribe antipsychotics, but they're also available, especially for people who suffer from like schizophrenia and bipolar. Those things can really cause a lot of problems with insomnia, and so that only you know makes their mental health problems worse when they're not sleeping well. So I think there's definitely a role for them. I just don't prescribe them myself. So what happens when we don't get enough sleep? So um, some of these things kind of run hand in hand with um, sleep apnea because sleep apnea is a problem where maybe you feel like you're getting enough sleep but you're not getting enough good quality sleep and it kind of runs into the same um, <coughs> uh, title as sleep deprivation. So um, weight gain is often seen with people who don't get enough sleep. And so what the theory is behind it is that your body releases some stress hormones um, when you're not getting enough sleep. It causes your um, uh, body to produce extra insulin. When you have too much circulating insulin, it causes weight gain. So sometimes I'll see people and they'll say, wow, I have just gained like 30 pounds in the last three months and I have not changed my eating habits. And you think, really, you haven't changed your eating habits? You've gained that much weight? But truly, I think that there is, uh, there's some science behind this. They've done some um, studies about infections. Um, people who don't get enough sleep, they don't build enough antibodies. They did a study with flu viruses. They gave flu vaccines, checked antibody titers. People who um, were sleep deprived ended up producing less antibodies to um, the flu vaccine. Diabetes is at a high risk because they're <coughs> having more circulating insulin. Um, it leads to insulin resistance. It can cause high blood pressure, heart disease, <coughs> I mean, any kind of mental health is not, you know, it's compromised by lack of sleep. So, um, <laughs> there was an interesting uh, study that was done at Harvard, and they uh, took a group of college kids, and they had a group of them be sleep deprived, and they had a group of them drink alcohol. And then they made this driver course, and they had them drive the course. And they were looking for reaction times, and there was like things popping out that they would have to miss. And basically what they found was that people who had 24 hours of wakefulness <coughs> resulted in as much impairment as having the blood alcohol content of 0.1%. So, you know, think about some of these teenagers who are out there who have had really busy schedules and they're driving home late at night. You know, they can be potentially impaired. So, um, you really want to be careful about sleep deprivation, especially if you're driving. If you have four hours of nightly sleep, four hours of sleep nightly for six consecutive nights. Um, some studies have shown it can cause higher blood pressure, higher cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone, um, and half the number of antibodies for a flu vaccine. So, um, aging and sleep. Um, we can talk about age, um, sleep in kids, sleep in women, sleep in menopause, sleep in aging. Um, there's all kinds of different subjects, but you know, a lot of elderly people, um, they just figure, I'm getting old, that's why I'm getting sleepy. Um, and so, your, your sleep patterns as you age definitely change. At, after the age of 50, I hardly ever see people having delta sleep, unless they're really active people and they exercise a lot. Um, so, um, but your sleep patterns, they change, but your sleep shouldn't be disturbed a lot. Um, People who are elderly tend to be on a long list of medications, and you know, medications can make you sleepy or potentially jazz you up. They can go either way. Um, advanced sleep phase. Um, this is a problem where elderly people tend to get sleepy in the evenings, early, while watching TV, and they're falling asleep in front of the TV at 7 o'clock at night while they go to bed. And then they're getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and they're just like, I really don't like waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, so there's a means of actually pushing a sleep schedule forward. Um, you can do it using some light therapy, some bright light therapy, but it has to be done very cautiously. But elderly people may not care because they don't have to go to work, so it doesn't really matter. Um, 
sleep tends to be a little more broken up as you age too. Um, pain can play a role in that too. Um, so that is somewhat normal. So um, sleep apnea is kind of the, the bread and butter of my career. <laughs> um, and uh, it's amazing how much sleep apnea is out there. It can kind of affect anybody and everybody. Um, it's known in infants as sudden infant, infant death syndrome. Uh, kids can have sleep apnea and it's very times on often um, diagnosed. Um, and um, it's really common, especially as people age, elderly people and people who gain too much weight. There's a high incidence of sleep apnea among Asian people. Um, Asian people have a petite airway, and so they're at high risk. But sleep apnea is basically a problem of the upper airway. It's a problem with people who have thicker necks and smaller airways um, that it causes, there's too much relaxation and collapsing of the, the back of the throat. Um, that can block off the airway and it can result in some snoring um, or potential pauses in your breathing. And it's not so much the snoring that's a problem. Now, people, some people come from families who the whole family snores and they're like, everybody in my family snores, it's normal. No, it's not normal for everybody to snore in the family. Um, it's not really the problem, but it tends to evolve eventually into sleep apnea. So um, when the airway closes off enough that you quit breathing, then you can start having some problems with dropping in oxygen levels, your deeper stages of sleep can get affected, particularly that delta sleep, and your, your dream sleep. Um, when you have uh, pauses in your breathing, your brain has these microarousals where your brain wakes up a lot and you're not aware of it, but with those microarousals, it causes an adrenaline surge that can cause your heart to race, cause palpitations, some people wake up having chest pains during the night, um, gasping awake, or potentially waking up feeling like a panic. Poor quality sleep often results in daytime sleepiness, and sleepiness particularly um, affects people in sedentary situations. So, my father has sleep apnea, and he says, well, I'm um, you know, um, and he says, well, I'm fine as long as I keep moving. Well, a lot of times, as long as you're physically engaged in something, you can kind of ward off that sleepiness. But if you sit down in a sedentary situation where you're having to do some work, you're reading, um, you're watching TV, that's where you're going to be more apt to fall asleep. But like I said before, not everybody who has sleep apnea is sleepy. And that becomes a little bit more serious because um, it seems like particularly older men who have a problem with sleep apnea or kind of resistance to getting it treated. And I tend to see them after the cardiologist has taken care of them because they've had a bypass surgery. So um, then they kind of realize that, you know, I probably ought to take care of it. So risk factors for sleep apnea. Um, if you have a body mass index over 35, it's based off of height and weight. There's all kinds of um, applications out there if you want to figure it out. There's not like a magic weight because it's also based off of your height. Um, but men with a, a neck um, circumference of over 17 inches and women with a neck circumference over 16 inches is an independent risk factor for having sleep apnea. And so a lot of times when people are going in for bariatric surgery, we have to do a sleep study on them because they're at a high risk of having sleep apnea. And if you have sleep apnea and you're going in for surgery, you are at risk of having a lot of potential complications um, in the recovery room or even um, when you're recovering from surgery itself. Having a small air airway puts you at risk of having sleep apnea. So like I said before, there's actually a really high incidence of sleep apnea among Asian people. Um, being male puts you at a higher risk. Until women go through menopause, then women kind of catch up with men. Um, Aging also affects sleep apnea too because the soft palate in the back of your throat where your uvula hangs down the back of your throat, that's a muscle and it has some skin and as you age, people tend to lose muscle tone and skin tone. Well, that soft palate, it's fighting, fighting gravity all your life and so that also tends to sit down lower and so that's why the airway becomes a little more collapsible with age. 
Some people have a family history of sleep apnea. Um, it definitely can run in families, and it's that you inherit different characteristics from your family, and a smaller airway may be one of them. Um, using any kind of sedatives, muscle relaxants, narcotics, or alcohol, all can affect how the back of the throat will be re more relaxed at night, and if you're relaxing those muscles in the back of your throat even more, it can potentially cause that airway to close off. <coughs> Smokers and people with COPD often have an overlap with sleep apnea as well. So I asked you folks to fill out your M4 sleep scale. So this is kind of a screening test for sleep apnea. Um, this is strictly really for sleep apnea. Now it's just assessing how sleepy you are. And so um, these are kind of the results. So really. If it's less than 10, you're probably okay. If you're somewhere between 7 and 10, you probably could use a little more sleep. But if you're over 10, there may be a problem. There may be a medical problem that needs to be addressed. Um, and if you're anywhere between 16 and 24, that's an excessive amount of daytime sleepiness. And you're really at risk of potentially having a motor vehicle accident. You shouldn't be operating heavy equipment. So I'm not going to ask you your scores, <laughs> but you guys can score yourself. Does anybody have any question about this? So why should we treat sleep apnea? I had to do an extensive literature review last spring, and um, there has been a lot of evidence-based medicine that has shown a significant increase in systolic blood, blood pressure. The top number, your blood pressure, can often go up. People who are on more than three blood pressure medications um, are often at risk of having sleep apnea. Um, your blood becomes more sticky when you don't breathe well at night. Your oxygen run low, runs low, uh, puts you more at risk of, of clotting, so strokes, heart attacks, pulmonary embolisms, deep vein thrombosis. Um, congestive heart failure is often a problem because it puts a lot of stress on your heart and your lungs at night when you're not breathing. And it can lead especially to right-sided heart failure. Um, it can lead to heart arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation. There's been some studies that came out that showed that 80% of people who have atrial fibrillation probably have underlying um, sleep apnea. Pulmonary hypertension, most people are familiar with it. With this diagnosis, it's a uh, problem of having high blood pressure in the short segment of blood vessels between the heart and the lungs, um, but it can leave, lead especially to exertional shortness of breath. Um, sleep apnea can cause diabetes. It makes the insulin level to run higher. Um, it can make cancers more aggressive. Um, the hypoxemia, the, the low oxygen level, can for some reason cause um, acceleration of the cancer cells. It's been recently associated with causing dementia. Um, it can really affect your cognitive functioning, um, your executive functioning, your memory. And so if you're, not, um, if you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain, it's a big insult. And then it can cause some erectile dysfunction. So these are some means of how we treat sleep apnea. Um, there's some oral appliances that um, there's a couple of specialty sleep dentists that can make appliances um, by making impressions of your teeth. The appliance has a hinge. They make adjustments to the hinge to move the jaw forward. By moving the jaw forward, it pulls the tongue out a little bit and it opens up the back of the airway. It's pretty modest how it changes the airway. So a sleep appliance like this is indicated for people who have mild sleep apnea, but if it's much more than that, it's probably not gonna be an adequate treatment. And you can actually quit breathing five times an hour is considered normal. So um, just because somebody says, well, you quit breathing sometimes, it may not necessarily mean you have sleep apnea, but if somebody's witnessing it repetitively, <coughs> it's definitely a, um, a concern. But mild sleep apnea is quitting breathing five to 15 times an hour. CPAP or BiPAP surgery tends to be the best treatment out there that's available. 
Um, there's a gentleman wearing a mask, and basically it's an air pressure unit. St CPAP stands for continuous positive air pressure. It's blowing air to the back of the throat, so when the back of the throat is trying to relax and obstruct, it's keeping the back of the airway open. It's basically an air splint. Um, people require different pressures, so if you're on lower pressures, CPAP ends up most of the time being an adequate treatment. If you need higher pressures, sometimes we end up having to change people to BiPAP. It's a two-pressure system. <coughs> And then surgery. Um, we generally don't send a lot of people for surgery unless you have really big tonsils. So there's an example of somebody who has big tonsils and then what happens when those tonsils are removed. It definitely compromises the airway. Um, removing tonsils in teenagers can resolve sleep apnea, but removing tonsils in adults doesn't seem to work the same way. I had a gentleman probably about five years ago and he was about 60 years old and he had really big tonsils and we had his tonsils removed and he had really bad sleep apnea and I thought well it's going to lower his CPAP pressure at most and that's what he was hoping for too but the problem was is we removed the tonsils and the tonsils are basically pillars pillars for the roof of the soft palate and so we removed the tonsils and his soft palate fell and so that's another thing that I sometimes see with people who have had bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery you get fat cells in the back of your throat. And what you don't appreciate is when you lose weight, those um, fat cells shrink. And so now you have empty space in the back of your throat. So a lot of people who have weight loss surgery, they um, are really glad when they get off their blood pressure, pressure medications, their um, diabetic medications, and then they want to get off their CPAP too. And sometimes it's not always that easy. So if you have bariatric surgery at a younger age, that seems to have a better benefit for um, sleep apnea than to have bariatric surgery at an older age. And that's all I have.